Hi, YouTube. Jack has something to say. Hey, guys. Like, comment, subscribe, share. You don't know how much that help us, helps us, okay? A lot. Believe helps us. Helps us so much. Helps us so much. I want you to help me today. Enjoy. Please. First of all, Katie, I don't know how to create a background for, for a show, okay? So I'm doing the best I can. I got some lights. I'll figure it out as we go. Every week, I'll get a little bit better. When, when did I talk about background? I, you, just I, said, you just said somebody else doesn't know how to do it. No. I was to say good things to you or know it. Someone fixed it. I thought it was you that fixed oh. it. You did something good with your audio. I didn't know how to do it. So I literally said oh. congratulations. Thank you. I bought a microphone. Wow. But you had that microphone last week, right? Wait, you shaved. I did shave. Ugh, disappointing. Sad. Well, Sad. I, got, I got made fun of on the yak for having for looking old. I'm honestly <laughs> surprised, though, you don't have, like, um, a suntan line for your beard. Because I feel like you've had it for a minute out in the Midwest. Well, uh, Midwest me doesn't stop and, and dwell on such things. Midwest me is a nice guy. And Midwest me is uh, all about going forward and catching a lot of fish. That's a good thing. Even... I will say, the response on fish Twitter yesterday when you asked nicely, what kind of fish is this? People yeah. attacked your, like, personhood. They were Jack, like, I've decided, I've decided that Twitter was a mistake. Yeah, uh, I, I actually, yeah. Have there you is no subject Twitter that isn't full of assholes. You can pick <laughs> up any, any subject you want in the world, fishing Twitter. Pool table Twitter, barbecue Twitter, steak Twitter, football Twitter. Softball. Everybody's an asshole. I, I, I am convinced there's like stop sign Twitter out there and like carpet Twitter. Like any any kind of anything has its own Twitter fan base and they're all assholes. It's a such it's so interesting how the human psyche just breaks on there. Uh, I don't even see it that much on on TikTok or even, I mean, Instagram's actually kind of bad sometimes, but Twitter is special. It's just, I mean, there's Reddit, but I would even say sometimes Twitter's worse than Reddit because there's more people on there. Or maybe Jack, actually I got, not. I got to ask you a question, Jack. Yeah, what's up? Uh, this is an off-air conversation. We're going to have it on the air because I got to figure oh, it out. Oh, God. This My, never goes well. It's fine. I've already had it with Katie via text this morning, and we can't figure oh. it out either. Jack. He just didn't My, like my answer. My fishing video on Twitter is at 2.5 million views. Yep. On TikTok, it's at 800. Yeah, it's just... Not 800,000. 800. No, it's just sometimes the it's... This is why I say that TikTok's so frustrating, even for me. It's like, I have these followers, show it to them. Twitter does a better job at that. And there's that's why, like even if people compare TikTok and Twitter and other ones... But it's annoying. Sometimes it just who they push it out to didn't like it, and then it just dies. It doesn't mean it was a bad video. It was just the cards didn't break in your favor. And on Twitter, enough people saw it, and then it became a thing. Weird. I, I can't figure it out at all. There um, may be, honestly, less assholes on TikTok, and that's why it just didn't – everyone's just like, oh, that's just whatever. And also, it had a lot of comments, so I think that – where TikTok is like, okay, it's getting more comments and the algorithm will bump it. Here you can see your friends commenting. It's like probably one per one big person on fish Twitter. God, yeah. Let's go back. It has Let's like go back a little bit. I got to go back to what Jack said. Jack said there's probably more assholes on Twitter than TikTok. Jack, in my 44 years of life on this earth, I've learned that there are assholes everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, no. And I will say I did see the video of one of the softball guys on TikTok in his car just yelling at you. Um, yeah, got to bowling too. Yeah, I will say there are there are assholes on TikTok without a doubt. Uh, they're louder on Twitter. They're hey, louder sorry. on Twitter. I need an update. So the little boy flew to Texas, no problem. No problem. I so I'm at some of my best friends from college house right now. Uh, there's a million kids in this household, so I you feel like, like I'm. At you look like you're in the bank about to sign a loan. Yes. <laughs> you know what's funny? He, the my friend is a, is a mortgage officer, so this makes sense. You know, he, he does he does this. I will so say, like, you know. I for those watching on YouTube, I've seen the start of the scene before. I this I've seen how this is I've seen <laughs> I've it seen like, it, the it ponytail. Like, the I can say it. I can say it. Men, 
Go watch the YouTube. Turn off the podcast. No, her bo- uh, her her boobs look really good right now, and then her hair. You look very nice. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it. Watch the YouTube. Um, You've been working hard yeah. in the gym. We, we can tell. Casey, Thank it looks you like so. you just took a five-minute break to think about if you want to go forward with this or not. And now you've decided you want to sign. You guys, right here. I'm ready. Right. I'm yep. ready to sign. Uh, well, to, I mean, a little look behind the scenes. I'm so far outside of the city right now that the Wi-Fi doesn't really work very well. So I'm on my phone. So the angle was my laptop, which was not as egregious. Now I'm on my phone. We're making it work. But no, the 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 flight that gave me the most anxiety in the world, the baby, he did great. We got compliments at the end. Like one guy said, he has four kids. So he's the best baby he's ever seen. And obviously we did nothing to make that happen, but we're taking it as if it's just we're great parents. Oh, we're great parents. Our baby didn't cry. All right. Speaking of crying, SEC Media Day started. Um, great time so to cry. You guys uh, – do y'all ever, well, I'll ask this question on the show. Let's go ahead and start the show. All right, welcome to Unnecessary Roughness, Barstool's college football podcast, brought to you by, excuse me, I have to go to the restroom. Okay, high noon sun sips. And let me tell you, Katie, this weekend was a brilliant weekend for high noon, even though, was it raining in Connecticut? It rained so badly on Sunday. You wake up, you're like, it's a gross day. I want to stay inside. Now, I will say we do need a new pallet in the office. We do. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, I have two boxes in front of me. Yep. They're under lock and key. Uh-huh. I don't keep <laughs> them. The sales people keep them because otherwise people steal them. Nope. Yep. They are the hottest commodity in the office without a doubt. And that's because the quality of them is through the roof. And we're privileged that we get them shipped to the office. But if they didn't, if they weren't coming to the office, we would be paying for them because that's how good they are. I'm going to be drinking them all summer and then into the fall. I like High Noon the best during two events. One, college football. Two, while I'm watching UFC. Those are my favorite. Well, I'll also Maybe at, a bar, at, a, at a bar or like outdoors like on a rooftop. Um, but... Those are my favorite, and others may be on the beach or whatnot, but this summer, go and get it at Drizzly. It's everywhere. I mean, if your bar, your local place doesn't have High Noon by now, they're slacking. That's not High Noon's fault. Ask them. Ask them. them. Tell them. Bring it in. High Noon. High Noon, uh, we have the seltzer, the tequila, and whatnot, and Tall Boys. The Peach Tall Boys. If I could do one request for this new shipment, please, please, High Noon, send us some Tall Boys of Peach. And... Yes. Thank you, I Noon. And Brandon, are you, did you uh did you relieve yourself? Uh, oh Bueller. Oh Bue oh there he is. You have to go out your backyard. Stuff. I didn't really have to go to the backyard. Ah, showbiz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went to my maroon pool table and shot some pool. That thing is not maroon. Katie, I swear to God. <laughs> I swear to fucking God. You not have, today. You have not to today, Katie. Not today. Wait, what maroon. Could you pull it up for yeah. me? Yeah. All right. Anyways, yeah, no. And we're in the uh, depths of. We should, I guess we, we should explain how, why Casey disappeared. That's a good point. I thought we were just going to do it. Uh, that ain't maroon. That, <laughs> that's the <laughs> furthest that's state maroon. from maroon. <laughs> that's my maroon pool table. That looks like you went to like some like small bar Sorry in the bar. middle of Kenosha and you just said, that's mine now. I'll give you 300 bucks. The actual thing might be maroon. You have to admit, the photo is red. I, I, that's not how colors work, Katie. We can. We're looking at a photo. The photo looks red. Can I ask y'all a question? Of course. Before we get into it, uh, we're going to do our most intriguing teams by conference this this week. Um, then I'll explain my problem with the word intriguing, and then we're going to do one win total on the Barstool Sportsbook. Then we'll probably get out of here. But there's a couple other news items today. So SEC Media Days is going on. Do you guys have any? I, it's the worst sporting event of the year. <laughs> I hate it. Every time I've gone, I'm miserable. But do you have any FOMO from not going? Yeah. Katie does. I I've said it once. I'll say it again. I, it's like a kid in a hot stove. I can hear like, and I trust. I genuinely trust you guys' opinions. I can hear it every time. The stove is hot. The stove is hot. I'm a kid. I gotta learn my lesson. I'm gonna touch the stove. I until I go there, I will come back and say you guys are right. I just want to go. And not even for the players and the coaches, but just it's all the people we've had on this podcast. They're there in person. <laughs> Oh, networking. Yeah, but, all, all, yeah, but Katie, all those people suck. 
Josh Pate sucks. You know, uh, Danny, uh, Andy Staples sucks. All these people suck. I also, I'll be honest. They're if, fine, by the way. If we were going to SEC Media Days and we left this morning or yesterday, I would have been dreading that for weeks. I would have just been like, oh, I don't want to go. I mean, I know that a lot of people listening probably think it's really cool, and I'm just, it's a point of privilege, me saying that. <laughs> point of privilege. I can't believe I said that. But, um,. It just looks like it's just a shit show. And the players, when they get there, the coaches, when they get there, they're just thinking about when it's over. Because it's like a interview process for them. They're just so done, my, done by the end of it. One of my favorite things that happens in these media days, not just SEC, is every year sports writers act like they've never met a person who can talk before. Every year they act like they've never met a person who wears a suit before. Every year they act like... The, 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 they've seen they've never seen a person be a leader before like a, a guy will and i haven't seen it yet but a guy will walk a player will walk into sec media days in a suit and there will be 30 tweets about how this is the best dressed guy ever oh my god this is amazing you guys can't believe it yeah he's not wearing a polo and tacky shorts like all you wait, sports writers but wait. then you have the jalen daniels moments like that's cool well he was wearing no no hold on he was wearing i know that's necklace a with highlights on but i will say brenda did you know that coaches and players can wear cool shoes Oh my God! It's crazy! Oh, look at this! That this coach got a pair of cool shoes from Nike that sponsors their school. Can I tell you something, Jack? And I, you probably didn't know this, but every player there worked harder in this offseason than he's ever worked, and he's got about 15 pounds more than he had last year, and he frankly, he's probably just as fast. Did you did you hear about this, Jaden Daniels? Not Jalen. Jaden. He is. He put on 20 pounds this offseason. No fat. Still moving quickly. Still moving as fast as he can. Every quarterback is moving as fast as they ever had, and every team's about to go 12-0. Every every strength coach, you, you just can't believe the difference between the, the last guy and this guy. He is about to do incredible things. The culture at the at the program is so much better. It's, it's really a family-type atmosphere now, Jack. It really is, and all they had to do was just come together. They had to get over that final bump in the road last year, but – once they realized, hey, this is the season, this is it, they all came together. And there's no way there's going to be any fights during training camp. Well, I mean, last year's failures and losses made them better men, made them better people, made them better players. Uh, and they're going to be better this year. Forget the fact that they're just average to begin with, but whatever, doesn't matter. It's, all right, that's SEC Media Days. We just, we just wrapped up the whole thing in 30 seconds. One more thing on this. I realize I the way you guys are talking about SEC Media Days is how I talk about spring games and fall camp. Everyone's like, oh, everyone looks bigger. Everyone looks this, that, and that. I don't know why SEC Media Days is different. Like, spring games, I, I didn't spring watch. Spring games them. are just like. I didn't watch even see spring games. I'm like, oh, you're playing. Well, what, what SEC Media Days is, and Big 12s was last week, by the way. What SEC Media Days is, is the unofficial start to the unofficial start of college football season. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what we've now done is we've turned the blinker on. We see the ramp coming up. We see the exit coming up into college football season and we just turned our blinker on and we're about to turn that's what sec media days is um anyway there occasionally comes there will be interesting tidbits out of all these uh you know last week big 12 media days you had Jaden daniels you had uh brent venables taking a bizarre shot at the university of miami did you see that one jack yeah there's that's another thing of these of these days i think i do you think coaches come with talking points yeah yeah but, but I just if you're the coach of Oklahoma and you went seven and six and you come to Big 12 media days and one of your talking points is to take a shot at Miami like keep your let's keep our eye on the ball here guys so what 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 are what are we doing I, I don't understand that at all now today Paul Feinbaum was on ESPN's coverage um Paul Feinbaum the luckiest man in sports media anyway so Paul went on there and one of the ESPN's um anchors said hey do you think this year, if Nick Saban doesn't win a national title, it's going to hurt his legacy? Mm -hmm. Paul Feinbaum proceeded to say, yes, yes. He's never gone three years without winning a national title at Alabama. He had two of the best players in the country last year. And if he doesn't win it this year, it will affect the legacy of the man who has won seven national titles, six at Alabama. To which I say, Paul is half right. Now, mm. forget, Paul really doesn't know what he's talking about at any time. And he's carried by a bunch of callers on that show. And that's fine. I, that, that is fine. But he doesn't really know what he's talking about. But he got it half right. What he didn't get right was saying that if Saban doesn't win this year, it would affect his legacy. Nothing is going to affect the legacy of the greatest college football coach of all time. 
That's what Nick Saban is. That's what he already is. Nothing that happens from here on out is going to affect his legacy in a negative way. It just won't. Period. So if you start with that premise, you're wrong, Paul Feinbaum. But where he was right and where he didn't really quantify it the right way, if Saban doesn't win it this year, I think we could argue that the legacy building is over. That we could argue that the leg the legacy he has been building is complete and he's probably not going to add anything else to it because if he goes three years without winning a title and let me just say this stat out loud because it's one of the most ridiculous stats in sports. Since he got there 16 years ago, Nick Saban has never gone three seasons without winning a national title. <laughs> that's the dumbest statistic in sports. Yeah. That's, that's absurd. That's crazy. But if he does it again this year, it's not just that he will have gone three years without winning a title. It's that he would have gone three years without winning a title while somebody in his own league is winning those titles. He will have been passed in his own league. So at 70 whatever years old, could the legacy building be over? That answer could be yes. But if he goes, if he doesn't win it this year, it doesn't hurt his legacy. I just said a lot of words. I hope some of them came through, Jack. They 100% did. I would say also looking at Alabama's future as a whole, even if they don't get it this year, I think they still have a very bright future. Now, I mean, that's really taken a – a big stance there, Jack Mack, like you're saying, Alabama is, is built for the future, but he's still recruiting high. It's not like the blueprint aspect of it is really declining. The only thing yeah. is this would, especially if Georgia passes them again this year, it would really look tough. It's not like USC on the other side of the country or even Ohio State on the opposite side of the, or not other side of the country or like above them sure. uh, is taking them out. It's that team that Alabama fans – not that they have a big rivalry with Georgia, but they they've been making fun. They've been making so they made some 1980 jokes back in the day. It's his assistant too. Yeah, yeah, it's an assistant too. Now the only thing is, there's going to be a point we look back on in 10 to 15 years and be like, that's when he lost it. But we he may not have lost it yet. And the greatest thing or hardest thing to do as a top leader in anything is one when to properly come in, and then two, when to properly leave. Um, and not to say that he could ever really leave in a way that would really affect his legacy, but you kind of want to go out at least relatively to on top. Well, I mean, there's no doubt we're closer to the end, to the end than we are at the beginning. Um, and if, again, if he had just gone two years without winning a title, which is still absurd, we're talking about a coach – and his legacy being affected after losing a title for two years in a row. If he had, but if he had just done that and Georgia hadn't become what they become, Georgia took what Alabama did and copied it and maybe perfected it. Like Georgia, Georgia is at the top of the sport right now. There's no denying it. There's no questioning it. There's none of that. Can Saban get it back? I think that's a fascinating dynamic going into the season. But at the end of the day, if he does get it back or if he doesn't, I don't think there's any way his overall lasting legacy could be negatively impacted at all. He is the greatest coach of all time. Period. Stop. End of sentence. And I don't think there's really much debate to that. Um, all right. So. Well, actually, would you? How mu would you? Would you want to be the next head co uh, head coach after Saban? No. You know, a lot of people say that, and, and that's fine. The the problem, Jack, is. The answer is actually a resounding yes, yep. even though it's probably a resounding no. Okay. The, the, see, the sports adage goes, you never want to be the guy to replace the guy. Uh-huh. You want to be the guy that replaces the guy that replaced the guy. Yeah. Okay? You don't want to be um, Ray Perkins, who came behind Bear Bryant. You want to be the guy that replaced Ray Perkins, who was Gene Salt. You, you, but when you say that, you can't ignore the fact that whoever – gets on this horse, gets in this saddle after Saban, will be pulling a wagon full of the best recruits in the country. Ryan Day. He'll have, he'll be handed the best program over the last 25 years. He'll be handed all these five-star recruits. Let's say he leaves in two years. The, the class he just signed goes down on paper as one of the greatest classes of all time. It was number one with a bullet. So while you don't want to be the guy that replaces the guy, you kind of want to be the guy that inherits what Saban's going to leave behind, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, without a doubt. The yeah, because I guess if you're the guy who replaces the guy, or who if you're the guy who replaces the guy who replaced the guy, 
the cupboard's probably a lot more bare because the guy who replaced the guy probably failed. Right. So, and I mean, I was thinking about it. You have to be very ambitious to take on that role. But also, I mean, <laughs> you're going to get paid a lot of money. So even if you fail, you get what? A minimum 30 to 40 million dollars i mean well that, that's that's one of the things about these jobs that we as fans don't really talk about what do you want that job you can't win there yeah he's going to sign a five-year deal worth 42 million dollars <laughs> and if he doesn't win they're going to fire him and he's going to get all that money so coaches don't only view these things as i want that job because i can win i want that job because it changes my family's wealth generationally i it changes everything about me so um i, I look for i look back through history like Spurrier was impossible to replace. Zook came in, was wasn't good, recruited well, handed off to Meyer. That's the ultimate guy replacing the guy who replaced the guy. I think. Yep. Um, like Ryan Day hasn't really. Has, That's what I say. Like we're kind of ob- like Urban, still very good, not the Saban level. We're kind of on the brink of potentially hitting that point. I think like it's probably a make or break year for Ryan Day. I disagree with that. Fair. But I see oh. why you're saying that. Like I don't think Which it's a part crazy. Do you disagree. Like, he has a few more years before judgment? Yeah, I mean, like, he's, for the most part, been unbelievable. He hasn't won a national title. Jack, I got to come in. I got to come in and take her side on this one. Because you look at that from a lens of every other program. If he loses to Michigan three times in a row, that's – they care about national titles first and foremost. But they're not going to win national titles without beating Michigan. If he's losing to Michigan and thus not winning national titles – I, I think he would be in trouble if he goes like ten and two or eleven and one and loses to Michigan. I think they would have conversations. I would be really. You're right. They probably would have conversations. I would really be disappointed in that from Ohio State from the perspective of the grass isn't always greener. I would still. I mean, I guess it's like how would Ryan Day do at Oklahoma State? I don't know. This was the first time last year that Ohio State lost back to back since 2000. Yeah, twenty over two decades. Sure, yeah. I mean, and he's had right now. Ohio State, I guess, on their roster, they might have a super senior, but they're getting close to not having anybody on their team that's beaten Michigan. They haven't beaten Michigan since two thousand nineteen. Yeah, they, you are correct. They probably don't have a lot of players on that team that have beaten Michigan, which is a very that's almost a graphic we could make. Eight players on Ohio State's roster have beaten Michigan. That will get made by somebody this year. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if I was Ohio State. I would use that graphic in my fucking locker room. I would say, only eight of us have beaten Michigan. Are you mad about that? And then, I mean, I don't know. I assume the players are because the only thing is, you are right. If Ohio State misses the playoff this year, which would probably entail them losing to Michigan, yeah, there would be conversations to be had. Last year would have been fascinating because he he came within an eyelash of losing to Michigan and still winning the national championship. Yes, which was a fascinating dynamic. Um, but ultimately, he he didn't. He came up short in that game too. Anyway, we should um, also talk about where so, Casey went. I realize I interrupted before. Have we not? Have we not said that already? I think so. Noah Noah messaged us to be like, "Hey, we need to make sure." I, I interrupted with SEC. Who is Noah? He's this producer that we got last year. I don't know if you've met him. Okay. All right. Well, sounds like a real dick bag. Michigan. Michigan. He's a Michigan fan. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, so anyway, um, if you notice, Casey was here with us uh, in the opening, and she's in Texas right now visiting her cowboy and cowgirl friends, <laughs> and they're out on the ranch, um, the Ponderosa, riding horses and doing whatnot, and they don't have good internet out there. So she – she couldn't stay with us because her internet kept going out and I kept getting frustrated and I yelled at her and made her leave. No, you Aww. didn't. You actually handled, I would say, 2019. Brandon would have yelled at the top of his lungs. You you were very mature and took a step off the Midwest screen. Midwest Brandon. Yeah, and you said. Doing well. But you, you Brandon did say, we're not going to be able to do this with her, which was unfortunately true because the internet just wasn't holding up for her we didn't hit the one two three what the heck is bothering me though so that's a win yes but those i'm glad that that that's really great um anger management by brandon we love midwest brandon so yes that's where casey is that like i'm rico bosco okay i'm never it's not like i've ever had anger issues on this show <laughs> oh um, i never no, compared never. you to rico bosco yeah, no. i never compared you did you no, see I just 
I, I was just bringing that name up because Katie prefers Rico Bosco to me, as Woo! as, you just as evidenced by her Twitter account. Oh my God! Hmm? Doesn't she pretty much run your Twitter account? I mean, come on. Yeah, and then on her personal Twitter account, she'll tweet out pictures of him holding up the dozen trophy. Oh, that was crazy! That was crazy! I, I, I when when she was doing laps around that on be, the dozen. Well, night. let me be so clear. I said, uh, flashback. Monday, Nadu leaves. Thursday, he won the dozen. I tweeted out verbatim, what a week for Bosco. No exclamations, <laughs> no nothing. Like, you can, okay, don't we talk about this? With a picture of him holding up the trophy. I don't report to you. By the way. It's the same way we talk to fans. Like, we talk Oklahoma, say Oklahoma's good. We're not shitting on Oklahoma fans. You can talk about one person without directly shitting on another. By the way, Bosco in New York is... You can tell he's trying to put his alpha foot down as, like, the lead of the office. Oh, he asked me to do something. I'm like, no, go email someone. I, I dismissed him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, my text. Oh, yeah. He wanted you to print something like you just – like, we have interns. I also literally was like, yeah. Like, I, I told him the same steps. I'm taking a print something. He's like, I don't want to make it a big deal. I'm like, just go ask this guy. So, no. I literally was going to sit downstairs, made eye contact him with him this morning, Brandon, and walk back upstairs. Rico Bosco asked you to print something? And then gave her the gaslight of the century where she, when he said, uh, it's not that big of a deal, but I would just love for it to end up on my desk. If it, uh, yes. Uh, he wanted her not to print one paper. That's different. Like print and bind. Three. Oh, yeah. He wanted it binded, too. Oh, okay. All uh, right, whoever right. from Viva's I'm, watching this, I've already texted don't... him. Don't worry about it. No, I've already texted uh, him. He's going to come or whatever. <laughs> but, whoever's watching from Viva, don't need to clip this. If Gino? Probably. Gino, uh, do, Neil, please don't. Thank you. Yeah, well, Neil sucks too. Okay, oh, so nice. no, he sucks. Um, all right, college football. We're gonna talk college football. We're gonna talk um, last week, and I hate the word interesting or intriguing. I don't think I've landed on the word yet for this topic. I really I don't. I said volatile, but that's not. I don't like best. volatile either because yeah. that that volatility indicates negativity, right? Mm -hmm. To me. When we're talking about this topic, last week we did it with quarterbacks. I think it's more clear on the on the teams. It's the most intriguing teams by conference for the 2023 season, which means these are not the best teams. In the SEC, Georgia's the best team. In the uh, Big Ten, Ohio State, Michigan are the best team. There's no real arguing here. But behind them, who's the most interesting? Who could go nine and three, ten and two, eleven and one, and who could go two and ten? Who three and nine? Guess who he texted, texted you? Yep. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Don't text her. Text me. So now, 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 not only going through an opening rant on a football thing, I'm texting with uh, Rico Bosco. <laughs> no, so. the interesting, intriguing is because you could, it's so tough because the, the word almost lends you to believe that most interesting team or intriguing team should be the best team, but they're not. Because there's so many aspects. I mean, if we look at, not to ruin anything, but if we look at the Big Ten or the Big 12, who is the most intriguing? I think you have a lot of arguments, and I think we'll have, for certain schools, I I think we'll all differ in who yeah. our Big 12 team is. And same with every other conference. I think ACC has a really interesting team this year that not a lot of people well, are talking about. I think it's it, it, interesting. I'm going to use the word interesting again, but if you look throughout the conferences, I think the SEC has got like eight or nine teams that you could award this award to. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the Big 12 has three or four. The Pac-12 has three or four. The ACC has got like two. Yeah. Um, and then the Big Ten, to me, the Big Ten is lock, stock, and barrel, one team far and away more than everybody else. But I agree. maybe you guys will have a different answer than me. Um, but I, I think that the Big Ten is just so easy when it comes to this. So we can start with the ACC, if you'd like. Yes, um, let's do that. Start with the ACC. And most interesting slash intriguing slash volatile slash whatever you want. But the team that, that interests you the most going in, to me, it's the North Carolina Tar Heels. Ooh. And I'm sorry, Katie. I know I know you don't want to hear that. But Florida State is has joined Clemson as a co-favorite. Florida State is back where they were a couple of years ago, at least in the preseason, on top of the conference. Clemson's Clemson, right? They're either going to go 12-0, 11-1, 10-2. They're going to be really good. Then behind those two teams, I frankly don't see a whole lot. Virginia Tech does nothing to excite me. Virginia's garbage. 
Uh, Pitt is just Pitt. Syracuse, I mean, there's nothing in this conference that just gets me excited. NC State looks okay. Um, you know, Duke, interesting. Uh, Georgia Tech a little bit. But to me, it's North Carolina. They have what could be the best quarterback in the entire country. Mm -hmm. uh, Caleb Williams has that trophy right now. But Drake May is right behind him. And Drake May is really good. And they're going to score a lot of points. All they got to do is kind of play decent defense. And they're a thorn in the side of Clemson and Florida State. That's a big but ask. If you if if you like outside of Clemson, Florida State, if you tried to sell me season tickets to a team in the ACC, I would say North Carolina, no problem, because I get to see Drake May every week. At the very least, on offense, they have ten win talent, but do they have it anywhere else? Yes, I actually I'm surprised you said this team wasn't interesting, because what is which is good because it has a little bit of conversation. I'm in incredibly intrigued by Miami this year uh, I mean they made one of the biggest bets in recent history in college football with Mario Cristobal and the first year was an utter utter disaster and this year they have a team that on paper should be pretty good you know like their t their talent level is through the roof specifically well, on I, defense I, yeah and they, they I guess that's the issue with them right and it's the issue with several teams we'll probably talk about today but they had talent on paper to be really good last year and it was just a dumpster fire and then tyler van dyke was turned into a pro prospect and a great player into terrible last year but now he's back so yeah there i don't know why i didn't think of them too they're, they're almost to me just like north carolina that's um, fair north carolina it's really trying to say who's going to line up behind florida state and clemson here and i'm stepping all over your time go ahead oh no no i think what you were saying is completely correct and almost took my point to the next level because who is going to step up there there it's that tier thing we could even tier teams um when we go into conferences kind of like top tier right there yeah. mid bad and that's a way to kind of look at them in miami i but their numbers last year were so bad i mean i'm looking at some of them right now that it's just truly truly like their points per game margin was bottom 30 almost every stat Outside of well, success rate was net 30 or a lot or bottom of teams, 30 think, for a lot of teams. I think two new coordinators is a bad thing. And for Miami, I think it's a great thing. Yes. Uh, you know, Kevin Steele might do great at Alabama, but I don't think the Kevin Steele that took the field as defense coordinator for Miami last year was very good. Um, Josh Gaddis. I don't know is a great, I don't think he's a great offensive coordinator and he certainly didn't fit with what he wanted to do with Tyler Van Dyke. So I think getting fresh life there in the coordinator positions for Miami is fantastic. And you do make the biggest leap in a program between year one and year two of a coach, if that coach is good. If that coach is good, you see it. You start to see it in year two. And Outside of some outliers like Sonny Dykes at, at TCU. But mostly, as a general rule, you want to see a good team in year two. And we'll see how good this team can be in week two. I mean, I know it's Texas A&M. But it's at home. That will be a big game, especially for both. It will almost – I mean, I this is before conference play and whatnot, but it will almost show us two very volatile teams that yeah. really have the talent on the field but could go in the dumps. Yeah. And we'll see. That game, I think, will be big. And uh, that game's week two, September 9th. And then after that, they have Bethune-Cookman, Temple, Georgia Tech. Then they have North Carolina away, so on the road. Clemson, Virginia, NC State, Florida State, Louisville. They have a tough schedule. So I don't know, yeah. like, their ceiling's probably eight to nine wins, but who knows? I mean, nine wins would bring me out of this feeling great if I'm Miami. Especially uh, as a fan. Yeah. Um, Katie, who's your uh, ACC? My ACC, I know we just said everything, like, volatile, maybe negative. I think I've officially – I'm just going in on full in on Florida State. I believe it. I think they're going to – so they're the most interesting to me. They also probably might be the best, could be the best. I'm just in. I'm sold on Jordan Travis. I'm sold on the defense. I'm sold on Mike Norvell. Florida State fans, either be happy about this or maybe I'm jinxing it. Very, very high end. Excited to see what Florida State does. Um, also, you said about the ACC, not much behind it. Looking at the Barstool Sportsbook, the top win total is 9.5. And that's Clemson. Otherwise, you got a lot of six and a half, four and a half, eight and a half, seven and a half, eight and a half. It's all the range. Like, 
So nine and a half is it is the best you can do? With Florida State and Clemson, I, I, I think the one fascinating element here is going to be the return of the big, huge ACC game of the year. Because there's no doubt the ACC game of the year is when Florida State goes to Clemson in, I believe, week four, maybe week three. Four, it's uh, it's early. Um, but they go to Clemson week four, and that's your game of the year. Whoever wins that is coming out with the leg up to win the entire conference. Uh, and that's kind of a throwback to – like 2010, 11, 12, 13, when Clemson was trying to break through and Florida State was breaking through, um, there was a five or six year stretch where Florida State Clemson was the game of the year in the ACC, and then it went away as Jimbo left and Florida State dipped a little bit. Now it's now it's back, and I think that's going to be fascinating this year. It's All also right, Jack- so cool to have stuff early in the year. Like not everything has to wait till week 10, 11, 12, 13 to have like LSU week uh, week one, LSU Florida State. It's awesome to have them, probably suck for the players, but as fans, to have the big game spread out, it's awesome. Um, by the way, I've officially told, uh, Rico said, is she mad? I said, yes, she talked to Gaz about it. So <laughs> um, I'm just I'm just now <laughs> bouncing him around like a basketball. Yeah, he's, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm laughing a lot because I see what he's texting me. Yeah, you're being a dick right now. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm crossing him up. I'm just... I'm throwing him around everywhere right now. But I actually have to step in because I don't want him – I don't want Rico to go to gas. The ACC is actually very interesting. How the bottom of the conference could be pretty bad. Boston College, Georgia Tech, Virginia, Virginia Tech, Wake Forest. I mean, Wake Forest has a long way to go in kind of – You know who I don't like this year? Tell me. I don't like Duke. They went They went 9-4 and four last year, uh, and they're kind of a sexy pick with everybody because that coach looks pretty good. We, that that schedule was not hard at all, and they didn't play Clemson or Florida State, and they got them both this year. That's a general consensus that the team itself is probably same little step up. The schedule yeah. went from cupcake to get fucked. So yeah. what's okay their win that. total? Five and a half. Um, yeah, I think they also play Notre Dame. Like they they've got a they, they've got a tough schedule. Um, all right, Jack, you call the next conference. All right, so let's just go to the Big Twelve. Duke is six and a half. Interesting. Plus 120. Um, so my we're going to go to the Big 12. And this is a team that uh, I think we we talk about Houston. We talk about BYU. We talk about Cincinnati, who's kind of being slept upon when we talk about teams going into the Big 12. And that's UCF. I think they're – I mean, Gus, Gus Malzahn is Gus Malzahn, but I think he was really a great hire for them, specifically past Hypel. I mean, they want Scott Frost, Hypel, two – to the Gus boss, and I think this is a team that if things break right for them, they could really have themselves a good season. And I was just going to pull up their schedule really quick. I think, I think uh, John Reese Plumley um, yep. has a chance to be a great player for them this year. Uh, I know they're very it's excited great about him. threat too. And you see, uh, the team is, uh, you know, returns 21, or ranks 21st in returning production. Uh, they're a relatively talented bunch. And then you look at their their schedule. It's tough, especially with Boise State at a conference away. But if you can win that game, then you, I mean, you could really go on a run. You have Villanova, Kansas State at home, I believe. Or is that, yeah, Kansas State away. Then you have Baylor, Kansas, Oklahoma away. So that's tough. But West Virginia, Cincinnati, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, Houston. I think they could really be the team that is the best within, with, in the freshman versions of the Big 12 this year. And well, I go ahead. I, I think this is also evidence as college football fans, you really got to train your mind and you really got to be on your P's and Q's and you really got to focus up when it comes to this conference realignment and everything. Because when I thought of the Big 12 and the, and the teams that are the most exciting this year and intriguing, I thought of the 10 teams that were already in the Big 12. My mind didn't one time. Not one time did it go to Houston, BYU, Cincinnati, or UCF. Um, BYU's. I don't know if the answer would have been in there, but at, at one, I'm just telling you as it is. I, I at, at no point did I think of those four teams. Um, but also, but I landed. Oh, UCF though. They're bringing the top um, their cornerback. I think to Corian Patterson. He's tied for the first FBS for interceptions last year. So like they're and they have their highest uh, recruit ever coming in. It's like. They're not slowing down. Like, they're using the Big 12 to their advantage. All right. So, when I think of the, the Big 12, 
and most intriguing. And when I say it out loud, it's going to feel almost like a cop out. But I'd be lying to you if I told you that Oklahoma it wasn't the most intriguing team to me. Mm. I mean, I like that too. I I just looked at the Big Twelve and I think, well, this is a team. This is a conference that had TCU last year go from five and seven to a national title game appearance. Um, but they're not going to surprise anybody this year. Kansas, I think they surprised people last year. I think they're going to be pretty good. I don't think it's going to surprise anybody this year. Kansas State's going to be really good. It really comes down to Oklahoma and Texas, and I'm choosing Oklahoma because they were so bad last year. Uh, you you shouldn't go six and seven at Oklahoma. You just shouldn't do it. And Brent Venables did it, and now he's going into year two, and it's not just year two, right? It's year two where he winning seven games isn't that it's not a big deal to them. Mm-hmm. Winning seven games is just spitting in their face. You almost got to win nine or ten. So you got to go from six to ten. And you got to do it in a conference that you're leaving. They're doing they're they're balancing all these these juggling balls, uh, where I, I have a decent quarterback coming back, but he got hurt halfway through the season. I don't really have much skill talent, but I brought a lot of talent in defensively. I got a coach who didn't really prove himself last year. He's got to prove it. And, oh, yeah, we're leaving the conference next year. This is our swan song in a league that we have dominated more than any other league has been dominated by a certain team. I, they're fascinating to me. I, can I see Oklahoma going 10-2? and two? Yeah. Can I see them going 5-7? and seven? Yeah, I think I can. Like, there's a world where Venables sucks, where he's just not a very good coach. Oklahoma fans don't want to hear it. There's also a world where Venables had a bad first year because he was learning on the job. And he gets out Oklahoma right back to where they were. And I don't know what world we're going to live in in three months. I, re- I really don't. Um, I think Texas is going to win the league. I think Oklahoma could finish second or sixth. That's what I think about Oklahoma. That's that's volatile. That's, that's a- as volatile as it gets. Yeah. And I think I'm talking too much. I think I'm going too long on my answers. No, no, no. that's very good. I, I, you're right. I'm like, clip, clip. Um, no, that's exactly why I said Oklahoma, too. I think Texas – you guys haven't been – I've been scorned enough. I'll believe Texas is back when I see it. They have all the pieces. It makes sense. Let's just see it, how it plays out. Yeah, no, I mean, everything's ever Oklahoma. It, it's Oklahoma. You shouldn't be doing that. Let's see what the recruiting looks like. Marvin Mims, can they replace him? I hope – I want the Dabo tree to be successful, and we'll find out. All right, Katie, call us a conference. Pac-12. Okay, well, let's just, let's just do the worst one. Um, okay, so the Pac-12. Um, Katie, the you start one. on the Pac-12. For me, I think it's Washington. There's a bunch of – I think, for me, the Pac-12 as a whole is the most interesting conference. I think the Michael Penix Jr. experiment and Kalen DeBoer, again, goes back to Indiana. Look at the Indiana quarterback, Michael Penix. Look at the Washington. Those are not the same people. Was the last year Penix, that was that a one-off, or is this the new normal? interested to see how they progress on the offense that's also one of the teams in the Pac-12 that has no defense so can they get that under control it's also I I know they've been in the playoff before but for like my realm of college football I haven't seen them be absolutely great I've seen the USC's Utah I'm excited for uh, Washington I want to see what they do Jack the most intriguing volatile interesting team in the Pac-12 this is a team that was kind of forgotten about even though they were almost more successful than USC last year. And that's the team that's also going to the Big Ten next year, UCLA. Obviously, they lose the electric Dorian Thompson-Robinson. But maybe that's what was needed. Um, Now, the quarterback position is what intrigues me the most there because Dante Moore is supposedly on track to become something special for them. And obviously, I mean, top quarterback recruit, they flipped them late in the cycle. But I think if we're looking at UCLA, they have a chance to really be one of the best teams in the Pac-12 this year. They were very close to beating USC last year. And I think they rank at the top of returning production on defense. If that defense can take the next step forward, we're looking at a UCLA team that can continue that USC versus UCLA rivalry into that next level while they go to the Big Ten. And who knows? I mean, also, this is Chip Kelly. This is one of the most popular coaches in college football, and he's a guy who should be able to take this team to a level where it's like, okay, they're competing for a Pac-12 championship, and that's what they're going to do this year. All right, my team is um, 
a team that's just continually disrespected, uh, and we're going to have three different teams on this conference. Last year, Oregon went ten and two. Washington went ten and two. USC went eleven and one, and they all got their flowers. Oregon State went ten and three. Oregon State went ten and three, but you're not going to hear as much about them. You're going to hear about Bo Nix coming back to Oregon. You're going to hear about Michael Penix coming back uh, to Washington. You're going to hear about Caleb Williams, obviously at USC. Oregon State not only went ten and three. <clears throat> they lost by three at Washington. They lost by three, I believe, to um, to USC, 17-14. They only got really solidly beat one time at Utah, and that Utah will do that to you. Mm-hmm. Oregon State is really good. Their coach. <laughs> oh, good God. Their coach is very underrated, undervalued. And then you throw in the fact that you have this roster coming back. They got the running back last year, uh, who's very good as a freshman. Um, and now Damian Martinez, in, he had 600 yeah, you, plus, uh, yard games in a row. You add in, uh, DJ Uyunglele, who's got a chance to revitalize his career. I think Oregon state is remarkably fascinating. Uh, I think they're they one of those teams that you're never going to see them talked about more than Oregon or Washington or USC. That doesn't mean they can't be as good or better than all of those teams. And there's something right. special about that orange that orange, the the orange that they wear, I kind of like. Yeah. Also, I love. And, go and on. Their, name, their name of the Beavers, which is another word for vagina. And that's what Katie's all girls yep. elementary school was named. K through twelve. K through twelve. The all be- girls school, the Burley Beavers. Burley Beavers. Anyways, <laughs> uh, the I can't Not, wait to watch. Oh, them. No, he he mispronounced, I, but it's better that way. Burley. I, yeah. I never knew it was Burley Beavers. That sounds like a softball team. It's. it's <laughs> It's rarely, but uh, rarely be, be careful better. now. <laughs> That's a good joke, though, so it's fine. It, um, also for Oregon State, their 10-win team, that's the first time since they've done that since 2006. And I love seeing highlights of Chad Ochocinco, where he was Chad Johnson back in the early 2000s. Um, when when were they really good? 2000? Did they make the Rose Bowl? Uh, I mean, they, they bubbled up a couple times. Yeah. Uh, um. Anyway, before we get to the SEC and the Big Ten, I got to tell you, it is summertime. That's what time, obviously, you want to eat. I want to eat. We want to eat good food. And I want to tell you to take a bite out of summer with HelloFresh from Chef Crafted Seasonal Recipes to their new fresh and fit summer menu. HelloFresh brings flavor right to your door. Pre-portioned ingredients help cut down on food waste, while step-by-step instructions make cooking a breeze, not a chore. HelloFresh is delicious, both of you. Oh, we love HelloFresh. Katie sent through our HelloFresh order for us, and that's what it's all about. We I love, signed up so quickly. We love HelloFresh. It's so easy. It gets sent to where you live. You pick it up. It's cold, and then you can either cook it that night. You can put it in the freezer. You could freeze it even. Let's say something happens where maybe you're out or whatnot. Put it in the freezer, defrost it, and everything's there. And the only thing you really would need to freeze would probably be like if it was meat yeah. oriented. It's also during the summer, cooking inside is hot. You want to get in and out as quickly as you mm. can. But because HelloFresh is everything kind of prepackaged, pre-portioned, you can like go in, get out. You can you don't have to spend one extra second in the hot kitchen. And also, when you want to be outside, everyone want, wants to be looking lean. They have like they have quick options. They have yes. nice, healthy and fit. So you don't have to do it's all that you can choose like the family style the pescatarian all the options it's peak time for summer produce hello fresh make sure you get all the best picks all season long their ingredients travel from farm to door in less than seven days for quality you can taste go to hellofresh.com slash walker 50 use code walker 50 for 50 percent off plus free shipping that's hellofresh.com slash walker 50 use code walker 50 for 50 percent off plus free shipping we go to the uh, call it jack Big Ten or SEC? Big Ten. It's Penn State. We go to Big Ten. It's Penn State. Huh? It's Penn State. You think that? It's you, you. Okay. This is the conference I thought we were all going to agree on the same team, and it's not Penn State to me. Okay. It's not to me either. I. Okay. So, so you go ahead and give give the Penn State spiel, and I'll follow up with my team. I think this is the most real this team's been probably in terms of national championship contender since the Saquon year. Um, and then before that, man, we're going back into Joe Pa years in terms of national title contender. And you have a quarterback who's the chosen one at the school. Obviously, first year is not everything, but this is a big first year for this guy, man. Drew Aller is supposed to really take that next step. This is the year, and Penn State fans are excited. 
This is yeah. probably the most excited they've been in a little bit. And you can't blame them. I would be excited too. So I'm really looking forward to Penn State. And can they get over that hump, which is beating Ohio State or Michigan? They've done it before, but this is the year that they really need to do it because there's three top teams in this conference. And they're arguably, like you could make an argument, they're three of the top five teams in the country. I think you would have to make some leaps to get there. But theoretically, if they all play at their best, I think they're up there. Um, now, yeah. so that's why I have Penn State there as my most intriguing team in the Big Ten. I mean, you're right. I, I think they're a national title contender. I think this year is the most likely scenario we've or most likely year we've seen for chaos to happen where Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State all split 1-1 where maybe Penn State beats Michigan, Michigan beats Ohio State, Ohio State beats Penn State. Like, that's on the table. That can happen. They got – and I know on paper the Michigan running back room is probably better because of Corum and um, Edwards. Edwards. But uh, Penn State's running back room takes a back seat to nobody, and they were freshmen last year. They're incredible. The, the quarterback looks good. They got defensive studs like Kalen King. They're going to be good. They're going to be in the national title mix. They're not my most intriguing team, though. Mine is – and I don't know if Katie's going to nod yes or no. To me, it's easily Wisconsin. Um, I have a different you, one. You have a different one. I okay. Tried to, I, I, <laughs> I, you can have your individual most intriguing per person. Sure. It's fine. It's fine, Katie. You I, don't have to get mad at me. I'm not. Listen, <laughs> I understand that working for Rico now, you're under stress. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, Talk about a volatile boss. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Wisconsin to me. We have seen Wisconsin play football the same way for the last 30 years. They're going to line up in the eye. They're going to have a good offensive line. They're going to have two receivers. They're going to have a fullback. And they're going to have a running back that is the best in the country. That, that, that's what Wisconsin football has been for 30 years. Maybe even longer than that. But that's not what it's going to be anymore. Luke Fickle took Cincinnati to the playoff, and he builds teams um, all over the field, but he builds them the right way. He builds them to be hard-nosed, to be physical. And he builds winners, and that's what he's got a chance now to do at Wisconsin. And they're throwing the playbook out. We're not just seeing a guy running downhill behind a bunch of white guys with long last names. We're seeing or spread it out offenses. We're seeing, um, you know, they brought in Phil Longo from North Carolina. He's going to throw it. He's going to throw it. He's going to throw it. And he's going to throw it. And he also has Braylon Allen behind him when he does want to run it. So um, Tanner Mordecai comes in from SMU to run the offense. Everything about Wisconsin it's fascinating, and the schedule is manageable as fuck. But Phil Longo, yeah. let's not forget, he's done some really great things with running backs as well. Um, Michael Carter, and then who was the other running back? Uh, Javante Adams. Javante. Yeah, when they – you remember – I mean, not to bring up Miami. My, Miami fans were on my side, and now I'm bringing up that game where you guys ran for like 800 yards on them. So it's not like Braylon Allen is just completely – uh, going missing. It's not like he's in a witness protection. Uh, witness protection. I'm sure they're going to use him. I uh, I come. I think we have two intrigue. There's so m I don't know. Maybe this is just off season bias. There's yeah. so many questions heading into this year. Uh, I think there's more questions and answers throughout the country, especially in the conference we're going to talk about last. Yes, I mean uh, the SEC is like what? Yeah. Anyways, who's your uh, Big Ten team? Iowa. Oh, um, I, I don't hate this. I don't hate this at all. I think it's just, again, you guys are correct. You guys probably have an example. When was the last time that we had a coach have a hard, like, you have to hit this? Maybe besides a win. Probably never. I'm just really interested to see you have to 25 points a game. Also, they're recruiting. Iowa signed two out of the top 12 players from the state of Iowa. So, like, it's catching on to them. Um, I'm interested to see what it looks like with Cade McNamara, just mm -hmm. with then with with Wisconsin, they don't think they have Ohio State or Michigan. It's like the very clear. It, this is like the you had one job, like that. Well, Katie, means. you kind of already said it, and, and and it's really you're right. You're right. We have, frankly, to my knowledge, we've never seen this. Oh uh, yeah, we, the, this is un, uncharted territory. Like I'm sure this unofficial where an offensive wins. coordinator has been told. An offensive coordinator has been told you have to average 25 points a week. Can you imagine? If we get to week 11 and they've averaged like 24 6. Yeah. It's going to be spectacular. He, he just opens it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. He brings Cade McNamara into his office. He's like, buddy, you may have to throw some interceptions today, but we're, th we're that this game is yours. 70 attempts. We're, we're throwing it all over the yard. All right. Their last game usually is in Nebraska. They play last. Yeah. They're just going to 
they're just going to sling the rock. Uh, anyway, yeah, you're right, Katie. That is, and not only is it fascinating that he has to score that many points and that he's the coach's son, but they went out and got a quarterback to do it, right? Like, K. McNamara is not chopped liver. Like, he's he's fine. He, he's not yeah. – uh, I mean, you know, I'm he, pretty interested. He's not Caleb Williams, but he's a solid guy. See, interested. Iowa, interesting. No, Cade <laughs> is forgotten. I saw uh, one of uh, – one of our, not our guys, at least my guy, Adam Brenneman was talking about him, who was the former Penn State tight end, UMass tight end that was doing media stuff. He was saying that Cade McNamara is one of the most forgotten quarterbacks. Makes sense because he didn't play last year. Yeah. But, I mean, let's not forget, Cade McNamara kept J.J. McCarthy off the field, and that was a little bit because J.J. was younger, but I think Cade... You remember, you remember when Harbaugh didn't have the nuts to hand J.J. the job? Yeah. Really let them both start a game? I think... That was early in the year, yeah. Hawaii, yeah, Hawaii and Colorado, Colorado and UConn? State. Yeah. UConn was the third game. Mm. And we haven't <laughs> talked about Cade McNamara since. He tore his ACL. Forgot about that. Well, she's right, though. We still haven't talked about him since. Yeah. So After the, after yeah. he transferred. But. All right. And now we get to the uh, Southeastern Conference. And I'll, I'll lead off here because um, I – I think I'll find it during this rant because I, I legitimately don't know the answer to this question. Here's what I know in the SEC. I think the SEC is filled with more questions than it's ever been filled with before, at least in recent history. I know Georgia's going to be good and they're going to be at the top. I know Vanderbilt's going to be bad and they're going to be at the bottom. I know Alabama will be really good and either get back to the top top or right below there. Every other team to me has a big question mark. Everybody is assuming that LSU is going to be a national title contender and they're going to be good. And to do that, they look at all the good things they did last year, but they ignore the A&M loss at the end. They ignore the bad things they did last year. They ignore that they weren't really – they were pretty good. They weren't great. The SEC West was just down. I think LSU's got more questions than people think, but they're not my most interesting team. We're intriguing as hell. We're changing an offense. We – any other time, we bring him back a quarterback with 10,000 yards and 85 touchdowns, and he is celebrated, and nobody talks about Will Rogers going this year. Everybody's picking us to go 4-8. and eight. Everybody's picking us to finish last in the SEC. That's ridiculous. Ole Miss is fascinating. They're getting this top 15 buzz, and I don't see it. Who's going to play quarterback, too? Jackson Dart wasn't very good. Spencer Sanders, we'll see. Now, Lane Kiffin's a great coach, so he's probably going to get the best version of them. Auburn, Hugh Freeze, question mark. Um, South Carolina, their fans think they're going to win nine or ten games. I don't see it. Kentucky, Devin Leary's coming in. Tennessee has to come back. But I think the answer is – I think the answer is Texas A&M. Wow. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with it. I've, I've heard this before. People, because people are defaulting to their talent as the answer. We're going to pick them to be second in the West, third in the West because of their talent, because of their talent, because of their talent. And this is where I think people get in trouble only leaning on recruiting rankings because you, recruiting rankings are great, but you also, ha, also have to have results. And I know their number one class was only there for a year last year, so I'm not judging them, but their classes before that were like 8, 10, 12, really good. And they were god-awful last year. So why is everybody assuming that A&M makes a leap this season and, and people are saying Connor Wigman is this? He didn't show a goddamn thing last year. Like, I don't understand why they get the benefit of the doubt and other teams do not. Could they be pretty good this year? Yeah, they could be pretty good. Their schedule, kind of tough. Like, they go to Miami second week of the season. That is, Jack already said it in the Miami point. That's two teams looking to bounce back. The mm. one that loses that game is kind of fucked. Yeah. Because they will have lost. Uh, they're trying to build back momentum and trying to get back on top of the mountain. And if you fall off the mountain in the second week, it's going to be hard to get back and stand back up. I, I think A&M is fascinating, and I would pick A&M, but, again, this conference, I could pick one of ten teams. Go, Jack. Their win total is seven and a half. I mean, you didn't book. even uh, – maybe you mentioned it, but didn't. I mean, even Mississippi State is incredibly interesting. It's a school coming off – we've we've really never seen this, a coach, an active coach, passing yeah. away. And that's not – and I would say they the team's done a pretty good job – uh, keeping uh, themselves together, and a lot of the players are returning. But that's another team that's very interesting. My well, hold on right there since you said that, because I, I do, do want to make a slight, slight announcement. I have always tried to remain very unbiased here. Oh, no. I will occasionally talk Mississippi State, but I, I keep it under wraps. But these motherfuckers are fucking around with me, and they're going to turn me into the old man. Uh -oh. uh, these motherfuckers, 
this this JD Pickle guy from from on oh. three who's doing whose who's whole show is just a Josh Pate impersonation. <laughs> uh, it, it, he sits there and he picks us to go four and eight and zero oh and eight in the SEC. He says, "Look at Mississippi State. They got six toss ups. They're going to go zero oh and six. You don't know what a fucking toss up is." Mississippi State hasn't missed a bowl since 2009. They're averaging seven wins a season for 12 years in a row. And all of a sudden, they're going to go four and eight. I don't see it. State has 21 of 22 starters that are going to be seniors or super seniors. It's the most experienced team in the country. And people are picking them to go last in the SEC West, and I don't understand it at all. So, J.D. Pickle, Jesse Simonson in all three. I saw you yesterday. Uh, Michael Bratton over there, whatever you're representing. You're all, you've all picked us to go last, and I'm just lining you up. And I'm coming back, and I'm going to destroy every fucking one of y'all. Just remember. What are you saying your win total That's going to happen. What? What are you setting your win total at? I think State's going to win eight or nine games. I, I, I think they're going to be really good. People are giving Arkansas the benefit of the doubt. People are giving Ole Miss the benefit of the doubt. People are giving A&M the benefit of the doubt. Why? Why did they get it? And we don't. I, that, that's what. That's my question. Anyway, um, Jack, did you even say your team? No, but I, I was almost just going to say Mississippi State. But I'll, quickly, I'll just say I the team I wrote down. And I also want to get on the record. I do like J.D. Pickle, but he, uh, the Josh Pate joke was – it does feel like I'm watching Josh Pate when I watch him. But, I mean, that's kind of a compliment. All that being said, I think Florida is a very fascinating team. Um, and specifically because, man, I, when I think college football, I think Florida. And they're really looking at a, at a proposition in front of them where it's – Really, another down year is really, really tough. The down years at this point are getting to the point where it's like the up years are not as prevalent anymore. And Billy Napier is in year two. And I was also going to – I was looking at Ole Miss because they have a team that should be good, but, man, that schedule is crazy because they got to play Georgia. Then they got to play Alabama, LSU. And we know Lane Kiffin. Nothing against you, Lane. You seem like a nice guy. He hasn't won a big game ever. Like, what's the last big game he won? I can't think of one. Yeah. The last big game he won was against Kentucky last year, and it really shouldn't have happened because one of Will Levis's balls got picked off like completely. And also, what that also wasn't a big game. It was two teams that had a soft early schedule that were ranked higher than they should have been ranked. Yeah. So I uh, I just rattled off three teams, kind of like you did, where it's just this is the most intriguing conference. A lot. I think the whole league. Yeah, I think it's the whole league this year. I, I think outside of Georgia, Vanderbilt, and probably Alabama, oh, every other team is a massive question. I'm not that intrigued by Missouri. I think I will know what they are. They'll 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 have some good moments. They'll have some bad moments. They'll and then pick we'll, off someone. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Also on that, Ole Miss, uh, according to FBI, has a hardest strength of schedule. Minnesota three is Florida. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have a defect. Minnesota's schedule is really tough, which is brutal for them because I think they have a pretty good team. It's on us. Do they catch both Michigan and Ohio State? Yes. Or do they catch both State? Yes, I think that's why. Man. And then I think maybe even Penn State, too. Anyways. These divisions, man, they, they, they'll just, every now and then, they'll just imbalance the schedule so much. Like, Ole Miss has the schedule we had last year. We had to play Alabama and Georgia. That sucks. I mean, that, and LSU. Like, that. That, that sucks. Anyway, yeah. uh, Katie, who's your SEC team? They have sorry, they have Nebraska, uh, UNC, Northwestern, Louisiana. They have Michigan, Iowa, Michigan State, Illinois, Purdue, Ohio State, and Wisconsin. Oh, at least no Penn State. Rough. And then they have, yeah. and then North Carolina out of conference really brings them up to another level too. Thank you, but we'll find out. Um, for my interesting, I think this might be the Brandon effect wearing off of me, and or just Hugh Freeze being before my time. <laughs> I'm so excited to see what Hugh Freeze in the SEC looks like. I College football is not on my radar during the Ole Miss time. I'm interested in the jokes. We should do a tally how many times, like, Whore Eagle is said this year. But it's interesting to see, like, is Peyton Thorne the guy? We were, I wasn't very impressed with Has Michigan Has he DM'd State. you yet? Hugh Freeze now. Yeah, he'll DM you soon. <laughs> yeah. I would say 90, but the, the win total on that is 95%. <laughs> Fair. Well, not because like you're a thing. woman. He DMs everybody. everybody. Here's my thing about also because you're a woman. Um, here's my thing about Hugh Freeze. I feel like we have kind of mythologized Hugh Freeze and how good of a coach he is. But when you look back at Ole Miss, his best successes were on the recruiting trail. Mm. He took Ole Miss from a team that recruits in the 15 to 25 range, which is where they usually are right now under Kiffin. 
Um, I mean, they really care about recruiting. They really do it well. And he took them up to top three. He got Kimdichie, he got Tunsil, he got all these guys, and he changed their profile in the recruiting space. But he has to come in and win at Auburn that has to go play Alabama and Georgia as rivals every year. And the thing about it is his best season at Ole Miss, he never won more than nine regular season games. That was his peak. He won nine and three, nine and three and nine and three in 2014 and 15. That Ole Miss and Mississippi State, that gets you a statue. That makes you a legend. At Auburn, if one of the nine isn't Georgia or Alabama, you're getting fired in four years. So I, I just feel like we kind of mythologize who he is and what he's done and just assume that he's going to win at a high level at Auburn. Now, he will recruit at a high level at Auburn, I know. But he took that number three class at Ole Miss and never won double-digit games in a season. The, so, the, what? The lack of success from Ole Miss's history is almost shocking to me. There's one. Well, I don't, we don't have to get into all that. I, I don't want no, to. No, I, I know, I know. But there's another school like this in basketball when. When I learned this year that Creighton made their first Elite Eight ever this year, I was I looked around and was what, what? And then when I heard last year or the year before that was the first time Ole Miss won ten games in a season, I was or since like 1947 when um it was just uh you know John Reese first whoever in, in these college football games. I was I was I was a taken back. I was a taken back, man. So Katie, you're fascinated by Auburn. Yes. I'm interested to see what the hype is. It's being forty three new players and twenty of them are on the offensive or defensive line. Like it's in the trenches for him this year. Well also there's one element of, of, of college football fandom these days that whenever you get a transfer quarterback you get excited, but Peyton Thorne? I think the same at Florida and at Auburn, but are you really excited getting yourself excited over Graham Mertz and Peyton Thorne? But wait, like, but look at Michael Penix Jr. It's a like you, yeah, you never know. Fair. That's like, like I always look at college coaches. It's like they're seeing something. Like something is there. Like Kalen DeBoer saw Michael Penix Jr. We did not. I'm low key more excited for Peyton Thorne than Graham Mertz. I don't well, really know what how. I mean, I guess if Graham was really in a archaic system but Peyton I think Hugh could Hugh is the king of making average below average quarterbacks look decent for everything I said about Hugh Freeze and, and not winning more than nine games he he is fantastic with the quarterback position he won games with Bo Wallace he won games with Chad uh, he Kelly. found and, and, and Chad Kelly and then uh, Malik Willis like he's he's been a quarterback guy so I have no doubt he'll get the best version of Peyton Thorne, but is the best version of Peyton Thorne that good? We'll have to figure well, that out. I also think uh, Ashford is not completely a lost cause, but them going out and getting a guy after spring ball almost yeah. signals to me that Hugh didn't love him. Ashford's completion rate was the worst for Auburn QB since 1998. They were also a mess, though. I mean, they were they were a mess everywhere. They they were you know Cadillac Williams was coaching them. They were trying to just get to the end. They were they they were a mess from the start. Um, all right. So now we do group of five or others, and to me this is easy because group of five includes others. Um, I guess maybe I should be. I should say something like Tulane. Can they follow up? They still got Michael Pratt. I should say something uh, like Coastal with Grayson McCall and a new coach. Um, to me, though, I, this is the top, the time I just have to talk about Notre Dame. Um, Are we all doing that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, we all. <laughs> I mean, for me, yeah, Notre that Dame's. Mine too. Yeah, I mean, uh, you have the quarterback coming in from Wake Forest. What, what They've lacked a quarterback. Even when they were good a couple of years ago, um, they just haven't had dynamic quarterback play in a while. Their, uh, their running back that they're bringing back this year is somebody nobody talks about. And I do not know how to say his name, Jack, if you know how to say it. But it's Aldrich Esteem is what it looks like. Um, this guy is a bowling ball. He is a, a he is a wrecking ball is actually the better ball to call it. He's fantastic. The defense is good. It's going to be good as always. And Freeman has to take a big step forward this year in his second year as coach. I think it's Notre Dame, Notre Dame, Notre Dame. And their schedule, I mean, they play everybody. They're on everybody's schedule. They play USC. They play Ohio State. They, they're on everybody's schedule. So everybody who thinks they're a national title contender is going to have to eventually prove it against Notre Dame. It's kind of a fascinating schedule, and it's a cop-out to pick Notre Dame, but it's also the correct answer. We, we a cop-out as well. Yeah. 
I mean, you could you could look at some random. There's some. I actually have a. When we get to the win totals, I have a G5 team that I think could be one of the best G5 teams. And by that spoiler alert, a spoiler alert, I will be taking their win total over. But Notre Dame. I mean, Sam Hartman was was a Heisman candidate in at Wake Forest. This is that's very impressive, and obviously, change of scenery can either help you or take you back. I think he's ready for the pressure. I mean, he's, he's he better be. He's like 23, 24. He's mature. And this is a team. The defense is ready. Marcus Freeman really needs to take that step forward, and I think he can. And, you know, it's not – it's it's when Notre Dame's good at football, I do think it's, it's an interesting aspect to the fold. I'm not saying it's good for the sport. I'm just saying yeah. because of their schedule – it's very interesting to throw them into the mix because a team like Ohio State, a team like USC, has to consider them while they're trying to win their conference. All right. Now, for a rare bit of synergy on the show, before I get to our last topic, i got to tell you about the Barstool Sportsbook. Ooh. And I don't know if you guys, I'm sure you have, Jack. You've seen the new sportsbook, the new streamline. I love new, it. It's, it's so much better, so much cleaner, so much easier to use. It's fantastic. Um, we got, we now have win totals for college football on there. Not that we didn't have them before. We have win totals for college football. We have futures. We have all these great college football bets you can make. Just imagine in less than, I guess, about a, a month and a half now, we'll be waking up and we'll be staring at that board and we'll be saying, how am I going to play college football today? That's the feeling that we're chasing. And we're doing it with the Barstool Sportsbook app, number one sports betting app in the country. Um, Yeah, hold on. No, it's yes, nice. there's so there's stuff right now. I mean, we brought up Clemmer, Clemmer's yeah. up. Clemmer's killing it in baseball. Killing it in baseball, and he's still been killing it. And there's other bets. There's uh, you know, Meatball Molly, Molly McCann is fighting this weekend at UFC London. Uh, so she is back in the cage. She won't have a bet on herself because I, that would be illegal. But she, you will be able to if you want to have some responsible action on her. That should be fun. There's a lot of things. This baseball's in full swing, and then before you know it, man, football is going to be in, is going to be here, and you're going to want to be on the Barstool Sportsbook app for that. It's all fun. It's right. exciting because you can see the win totals. You can see all the conference championships. It's yeah. – the uh, brand before the show is like, go pick a win total. I spent way too long just scrolling through, getting up, like seeing – also seeing the odds boost, it gives me an idea of like, okay, this is where people think this team should be. Do my notes match up? It's almost like a preview in itself to seeing where everyone's win totals are. Download, sign up for the Barstool Sportsbook today. Terms apply. You must be 21 or over. A gambling problem? Please call 1-800-GAMBLER. And that was the assignment. Go find one win total to talk about today on the show. So it's me, it's Jack, it's Katie. We all have one, Jack. I will allow you to go first. All right, this is a team I, I very much think – can honestly win every game on their schedule and their win total is at eight and a half any guesses it's not louisville is it no 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 but i louisville's not i i do see the i'm so confused on louisville anyways all right my team is toledo uh toledo mm -hmm. over eight and a half it is juiced on over eight and a half at minus 145 but outside of illinois and that first game of the season is a game that they could you know I'm not saying they'll beat Illinois, but if they lose that, I still look at the rest of their schedule and see a team that could win every single game. I think they're the best team in the MAC, and they return a lot, and I like how they're going. And, yeah, over an 8.5 for Toledo. I'm very, very intrigued by this team, and I think that's a very – that's my first one of the season that I'm giving out. And – we we're looking towards a great great season, and Daquan Finn is back at quarterback. He's electric, and everything outside of that. I mean, their only tough out of conference game is Illinois. Then they have Texas Southern and San Jose State. San Jose State is at home. If they beat Illinois, their other out of conference game is UMass. Um, I think. I mean, this could be a 12 and 0 team. So the Toledo, Toledo, holy Toledo, and. I'm going to be a Toledo guy through and through for the rest of the year. Toledo over 8.5, minus 145. All right, Katie. I'm going to go back to the well. It was the first thing that came to mind, a little bit of a gut pick. Going Florida State. It's over, eight, over I think, 9.5, also minus 140. 
LSU and Clemson are the only ones that I have question marks on, and I think they're at least going to be one of them. Mm. Florida was a good game last year, but I'm in on the Kool-Aid. I'm very high in Florida State. I will also be picking a future on them to win the ACC. Nice. All right. I had three that stuck out to me in the SEC because I actually do like Missouri this year. I think they're going to be good. I think over six and a half is a good bet for Missouri. Um, Then – Tennessee under nine and a half was my favorite, but it's juiced to the gills. It's minus 190, and I can't give out minus 190. Uh, but it is Tennessee minus nine and a half on the book. Um, I, I'm not going to bet it, but I love the under there because I think they're going to lose Alabama and Georgia, and then they're probably going to drop another one somewhere along the way. But the one I landed on is plus 140, and it's back to Texas A&M. Texas A&M under seven and a half oh. is plus 140 and I, I i just keep i just keep asking the same question all the talent that you say is there fine but there is a disconnect from the talent that is on the roster and the results they are getting and they open the season with an easy win but then they have a road trip at miami if they lose at miami this under is locked and it, it, it's it's locked i mean and they could lose at Miami. This schedule is not easy. Why do they get the benefit of the doubt? Why why do we assume Connor Wickman is going to become this great quarterback when he hasn't shown it yet? When there's other good quarterbacks in the SEC that can make a similar leap. Seven and a half is the number, right? So I got to produce five losses from this schedule. New Mexico, that's a win. At Miami, I think that's the definition of a toss-up. One of those teams will probably be a lot better this year. Who's to say it's not Miami? ULM, that's a win. Auburn at home, I'll give them a win. Then they have that weird game against Arkansas. It's always weird. That's a t- that's going to go down to the last two minutes. It mm-hmm. always does. They got Alabama. They're going to lose that. They got at Tennessee. They're going to lose that. They got um, South Carolina at home. In Out of the East, they got South Carolina and Tennessee. That's not a good draw. They go to Ole Miss. They're going to lose that. They got Mississippi State. They got Abilene Christian. They got at LSU. If it's a if I got to find five wins, I can look at the schedule and tell you right now they're losing at Tennessee, at Ole Miss, at LSU, and to Alabama. That's four. I've gotten to four without breaking a sweat. That means they got to sweep Miami, Auburn, Mississippi State, and Arkansas to cash. It's under. It's under seven and a half. You know that's some good reasoning. I. Yeah, I'm too in love with their talent, but I could be. I've been Jack, wrong. I know. I know. Is, I know that. It's, it's a blind love of talent. But we're also betting on a team. I think Wegman, you did take some step for, or steps forward in his last few games. Yeah. And then also, I do have a belief in Jimbo. He is. Okay, now let me throw this at you. There's a, there's a world where Jimbo and Petrino together on offense – doesn't work at all. So you're right. And would I be suge- am I suggesting right now? No, we got to take the over on this one. No. But I guess. But then again, I thought Texas A&M was going to be in the national title con- or conversation last year, and I was so so wrong on that. So Texas A&M has been taking me for a loop for a very very long time. And but they keep getting the preseason accolades and and and. And hype. And I guess it's ironic because I'm coming to you saying Texas is going to be good this year and they keep getting the same thing. But <laughs> that was my next one. was awful. Texas. Last year. But- they were awful. AM was awful last year. They lost to App State at home. Like th- this was a bad football team. I would say Texas, it- even from a talent perspective, is a little bit further ahead. Like uh, Texas, but- there's a lot more substance. Or substance. When, when it comes to AM last year, it wasn't like, oh, this is a good team that, that got a couple of bad breaks. No, they were bad. They were just flat out bad. And and I, I don't see them going forward in a league, which is very competitive. Everybody else is fighting the same fight. Arkansas is not bad. Mississippi State's not bad. Auburn's not bad. LSU is pretty good. Like, there's just not a whole lot of room for, for improvement there. And and I think seven and a half is an insulting number. And I, I don't think they deserve the benefit of the doubt. Under seven and a half is, is the bet for me. All right. I like that. I'm excited to see Casey's rebuttal. She honestly though she'll probably end up agreeing with you. That's my bet. Yeah, well, it's a shame she's not here because that was going to be mine the whole time. But it is what it is. All right, so she'll be back on Thursday. We'll be back on Thursday to talk more college football. Anything else? Nope. That is all. 
Thank you guys for listening. Like, share, subscribe. You can tell them that on YouTube when we do that in a minute. That's Unnecessary Roughness.